Hey everybody, welcome to season two of Ah uh, Yeah. Today, we're going to be revisiting a top- Ow! 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 Ugh, so sorry guys, I've just been carrying this PNG on a stick for so long. My arm is starting to hurt like hell. All right, hold on, give me a second here. Ah, much better. Well everyone, it's good to be back. As you can probably tell, things are a little different around here now. For one, my arm doesn't feel like falling off anymore, which is a good start. But also, there's so many different video topics I want to cover this year that I'm so excited to finally get to. Like, have you guys seen that Garten of Ban Ban game yet? <laughs> now that will be an interesting video, let me tell you. However, before we fully get into the main meat of this year's content, I felt obligated to deliver on one of my biggest promises from last year. As you all may or may not remember, although taking a guess here, if you're watching this, you probably do remember, last year I made an hour-long epic about FNAF's sister location, and why I'm not a huge fan of it. I expected the video to do pretty average overall, but that couldn't be further from what actually ended up happening. Just the announcement of the video alone made Sister Location trend on Twitter with tons of quote retweets and discourse happening on the day leading up to the release of the video. After many hours of anticipation, I do not like Sister Location dropped on YouTube, and I slowly awaited the reaction to it. What happened next, I never could have predicted. But first, this video is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the world's leading meal kit company that's all about making your life easier and removing the stress from cooking. All of their meals are easy to serve, pre-portioned, and are delivered right to your door with different recipes to choose from each week. That way you can stick to your favorites or try something new for a change. HelloFresh even gives you the ability to modify how you want your box delivered, pause or cancel your subscription at any time, or even change the servings per recipe to fit your needs. With fresh ingredients from suppliers chosen by HelloFresh to to the many different recipe categories available, such as Calorie Smart or Quick Meals, there's something here for everyone. Ordering online from HelloFresh is easy. Just click the link below to visit the website, then pick your serving sizes, recipes per week, what kinds of recipes you want, and it will even automatically apply my coupon code, uh, yeah 20 which will give you up to 20 free meals. Then all you have to do is sign up, enter your information, and you'll be good to go. From there, you can pick what meals you want and start living a healthier, less stressful lifestyle. Again, click the link below to use my code uh, yeah, 20 for up to 20 free meals to get some great food and to also support the channel. Thank you to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. I Do Not Like Sister Location started out performing like an average video for my channel. However, after a few days of it being up, it quickly rose to becoming one of my fastest growing videos in a long time. Currently, it's almost at a million views and will likely reach that goal fairly soon. There were thousands of comments for me to read, some better than others, multiple response videos, both direct and indirect, and even a video of some kid reacting to the entire thing, pausing every two seconds to tell me why I was wrong. Thank you for selecting exotic buttons. Let's go! You're probably wondering why I'm e Okay, so the thing is with the humor. An absolute legend he is. Hell, someone even made an entire response video to it using nothing but the Roblox chat. So if you ever wanted to read someone's thoughts on my video in the absolute slowest way possible, that's an option that's on the table. Something I was not expecting in a million years was for MatPat of all people to see my video and actually agree with me? Mm. Um, recently, uh, I think it's the Uh Yeah channel who did like an hour long review of Sister Location being like, I don't like that one. And I'm like, I never did either. So I'm glad that someone else is actually <laughs> seconding me on that one. I'm so glad Matt is aware of the iconic Uh Yeah channel. I wish him many more years of making Space Jam ice cream in his future. You know, I was kind of surprised there was so much support for the video. In it, I made sure to paint a picture that I was coming from a perspective of someone who used to love the game, but started to see the cracks in it over time, and I feel like this point resonated with a lot of people, especially those around my age who probably had the exact same experience growing up. And while the video isn't perfect, make sure to take a shot every time I say literally in it, you'll probably end up in the hospital within 15 minutes, I still think it's a good watch, and I agree with the majority of my main points. Obviously, there was a lot of people who didn't agree with my take as well, which is okay. I think I probably played into the replayability aspects a little too hard, which is mostly just because, as I explained in the video, the previous four FNAF games, and even FNAF World, all encouraged a lot of replayability. Having the series take such a drastic turn for a single entry, before immediately returning to a more traditional format in the following two games, always felt odd to me. I will say, I think as an overall experience, Sister Location is slightly better when played for the first time. But then again, 
that's the case for most video games out there. Having one that relies so hard on that first playthrough to keep the game interesting is just something I'm not too sure about. Especially when there are games that are both great on a first run and equally as fun in subsequent runs, even if the fun comes in a different way on future playthroughs. I think the first couple FNAF games are a great example of this. Obviously, when you play FNAF 1 for the first time, all the mechanics are completely unknown to you beside the literal basics on display in the office and whatever phone guy tells you. All the environments are new to you, all the scares are still hidden in the mystery of what if, and you never know what each night is going to throw at you. That first time getting jump scared in FNAF is one that's hard to forget. I think mine was me as a dumb stupid kid playing FNAF 1 on my old terrible iPad. It was in one of those super protective cases, and I was sitting in my mom's bed for some reason playing the game. As you could probably expect, I had no idea what I was doing, and died to Bonnie almost immediately. Not only was I shook after that, I was also hooked. I needed to play more and get through the game. I don't remember if I ever did it as a kid, but just the mystery and intrigue surrounding everything made it that much more fun and scary to me. Now I'm an old cynical 19 year old that has to pay bills and do taxes. And along with that comes the many years of playing FNAF that completely killed any of the mystery or scare factor that it used to have on me. I know the jump scares, I know the mechanics of every character, I know what happens on each night, there are no surprises anymore. However, even with all those things weighing down on it that may make it significantly less enjoyable, it's still fun even to this day, but for completely different reasons. Now that I'm older and understand the games more, the enjoyment of them comes from the core gameplay mechanics and juggling everything perfectly. I still love to revisit these older games to this day, and even if I like some more than others, they all still have that core gameplay loop that helped make the franchise so memorable even if it was a minor part of that success. Going back to Sister Location, while yes, the game has some neat surprises on a first playthrough, the experience relies so much on those surprises that going back to play it once or even multiple times will feel like an absolute chore. The lack of actual gameplay in Sister Location is so blatant on multiple playthroughs, and that was easily one of the main reasons I decided to make an hour-long video in the first place. However, there is an aspect of Sister Location that actually does scratch that itch I was missing that all the other games have. But it didn't come with the game at launch. At the end of my original Sister Location video, I brought up the game's Custom Night mode, but I never talked about it in depth. The reason I didn't is because unlike Sister Location's base game, I actually really like the Custom Night. In fact, it might be one of my favorite classic FNAF games to go back to now. I thought having this oddly positive section tacked on to the end of a mostly negative video would be very odd. So I promised to make a part two all about said custom night, which is the video you're watching right now. Before I go talking about all that though, I should first talk about my relationship with Sister Location Custom Night. For the longest time, I hadn't even played the damn thing since it was added around the time I stopped caring about FNAF when I was younger. Sister Location's base game was the last FNAF thing I had any interest in growing up. And even though I enjoyed it at the time, I gotta admit, it's pretty ironic looking back at it now that that was the game that made me stop caring about FNAF as a kid. Anyway. I never ended up playing Custom Night and had practically no knowledge about it, besides the roster and what some of them did. Because of that, I was worried I wouldn't like it for a couple months there, because I thought the character mechanics seemed pretty shallow in concept. Allow me to explain why I thought that, because I think it's a pretty interesting look into how the FNAF core gameplay loop can be twisted into different formats and still work surprisingly well. Let's take a look at FNAF 1 again as an example. In that game, Bonnie and Chica have AI that determines where in the pizzeria they will go. One of the coolest aspects about this AI, however, is that it isn't linear in the slightest. Bonnie and Chica are able to go back and forth between certain rooms, and when they get stopped by a door, they aren't just sent all the way back to square one. They often only get pushed back a couple rooms, and will be able to get back to the door faster because of that. The level of unpredictability Bonnie and Chica have in FNAF 1 makes them some of the most interesting characters in FNAF when it comes down to simply just how they move around. Their complexity then complements the simplicity of Freddy and Foxy's mechanics. Foxy has his stages at Pirate Cove that can be stalled by using the cameras, but the stages always come out in a linear order. And Freddy moves in a straight path towards the office until he gets to the last two cameras, where he'll linger around back and forth, looking for an opening to sneak inside. Neither of these characters have AI as interesting as Bonnie and Chica, but they work because they act as good side tasks you have to keep track of while dealing with the more prominent threats. Hell, even FNAF 4 has a sick AI system that goes completely unnoticed unless you have the map cheat on. The animatronics will move around different blocks of the house, and you can even even stop Foxy from entering if you're fast enough, which is one of the coolest bits of FNAF trivia ever. 
So, when I first heard about Sister Location's custom night and what everyone did, I was a tiny bit skeptical when I found out that not a single character in the entire roster uses any sort of AI movement system. Ballora is just a sound that gets louder on one side or the other, Freddy moves between two rooms at random, Foxy is just the same as FNAF 1 pretty much, Biddy Bab moves in a single route and gets reset every time, and every other character is just a little annoying distraction. A little fat squeak, a little cook. After all the praise I gave to the older FNAF games and their AI systems, I was pretty confident I wasn't going to like Sister Location's custom night. Which I know is a bad thing to do, but can you blame me? Not only did I already not like Sister Location's base game, but from the way things were described to me, it just seemed like UCN tier gameplay mechanics, but without the massive roster to back up some of the more lackluster ones. However, none of that really matters. What actually matters is what I thought about it when I finally played it. And can I just say, another reason why this took so long for me to get to is because you have to 100% complete Sister Location before you can access it. That's right, we're gonna cheat. Yeah, I know you can just go into the save file and unlock it in two seconds, but I'm no cheater. If I was gonna unlock it, I was gonna do it legit. I had to 100% the game anyway for my review, so it's not like I had much of a choice. Custom Night is a nice reward for 100% completion in theory, but it means you have to play one of the most mind-numbing FNAF games ever just to get a shot at playing what is essentially a standalone game that just so happens to be packed in with Sister Location. Which is kinda lame, but what can you do? Anyway, I booted up Custom Night for the very first time, sat down, looked at all the challenges, and then started playing. It took a little bit to understand all the mechanics, but once they started to make sense to me, everything clicked. I started getting really into it, and within only around 30 minutes of gameplay, I was fully won over. Like seriously, I cannot believe it took me this long to finally play this. It's genuinely one of the most fresh takes in the FNAF gameplay loop from an official game, and it's locked behind one of my least favorite games in the entire series. Before I get too deep into the specifics here, I think I should talk about what really caught me by surprise when I started playing through some of the challenges for the first time. That being the emphasis on sound in the game design here. FNAF as a series is no stranger to using sound for certain aspects, whether it be for pure gameplay, horror, or both. All the way back in the first FNAF game, one of the most iconic and well-known tidbits is that when Chica is in the kitchen, you can hear pots and pans clanging and will continue to hear that until she moves again. Not only does it add a layer of somewhat creepy ambience to the game, it also acts as a gameplay mechanic to know exactly where Chica is at that specific moment, which can save the player from checking the cameras for her and instead allow them to use that time for something else, like stalling Freddy or just saving power. FNAF 4 then took this idea of audio being used for gameplay and ran with it, making it the primary focus here. Breathing will notify you when an animatronic is at the door, so you always have to be listening to know what to do. This aspect of 4 is easily one of the main reasons I love it so much. So when it came to the Ennard fight in Sister Location, I was shocked to find out that it too also uses audio for a core gameplay mechanic. Every time Ennard moves, there's a squeaking sound that can be heard. Since the power draining on this challenge is so brutal, it's almost necessary to use these audio cues a majority of the time to know where they are on the map. Despite Ennard Knight dropping the ball in certain parts of its execution, this was always an aspect of it that I thought was really fun and creative. Sister Location Custom Knight takes the very basic idea seen in Ennard Knight and runs with it in all sorts of really interesting ways, making it arguably the FNAF game that relies the absolute most on audio. Like when playing FNAF 4, it's pretty easy to let your hearing down a bit while you're not dealing with the main doors. But here, you're going to have to be alert the entire time, and will likely have to wear headphones to make any sort of meaningful progress on some of the harder challenges. The idea of taking the core of Ennard Knight and expanding it into an entire cast built around listening and resource management is so brilliant, and actually plays into the FNAF learning curve I talked about in my sister location video very well. It takes something you already have some practice with, being Ennard Knight, and expands upon it with new threats and challenges to keep the player engaged the entire time. I just absolutely love how the custom night is set up here, and while it's not perfect, most of the content is an absolute blast. Although, I might as well get any gripes I have out of the way now, so we can focus on mostly the positive stuff going forward. The most obvious issue here is the roster. It's not all bad, but some of the choices here are baffling, and some of the omissions here are even more strange. This entire section of gameplay is confirmed non-canon, so why the hell weren't Baby and Ennard included at all? You can make an argument for Ennard that maybe it would have been weird if they were here, since they already have their own knight to themselves. But Baby genuinely has no reason to be excluded here. It's not like some hard line Scott has, where Baby can never attack the player in any way. She does so in both Help Wanted and UCN. 
so I have no idea what the reasoning behind this was, and it absolutely brings the entire roster down overall. When it comes to the characters that are on the roster, having Lulbit and Yendo there is a really cool addition, since both of those characters were part of the base game, but were simply just easter eggs. Huh? Of course, Ballora, Funtime Freddy, Funtime Foxy, the Mini Rinas, and the Biddy Babs are all obvious picks. But the rest of the roster is very weird to say the least. Bonnet is a recolor of Bonbon bon from the base game, and was probably only added because they were an easy recall. <laughs> Which is fine, I guess, but they are a bit of a weird addition. Then we have the Electro Babs, who are the exact same as the Bitty Babs, but they have yellow eyes and they light up. Okay, <laughs> sure. Oh, and how could I forget the iconic Mini Rena 2? <laughs> like, what is this? So yeah. The roster kind of drops the ball near the end there, but the inclusion of prior easter egg characters along with most of the main cast from the base game makes it at least passable in my opinion. Another very odd choice here is that as far as I can tell, you can't actually, well, customize this custom knight. There's a set of pre-made challenges, and yeah, there's a lot of them with four different difficulty levels each, but the ability to mess around with the difficulty levels on your own is just completely absent. Calling this mode a custom knight is a bit of a lie, it's more like a challenge mode, if anything. The challenges are an idea that carry over from FNAF 2's Custom Night, but at least there you could adjust anything to your liking. Not a huge deal, since realistically most people are just gonna play the challenges anyway, but a very odd exclusion nonetheless. That's pretty much it for general issues I have with Sister Location's Custom Night. There's a few other issues I have that are character specific, but we'll get to them when we get to them. The challenges on display here are actually really well crafted. The character combinations are all fun for the most part, and even when they're all on at once, the gameplay flows surprisingly well, and never feels too unfair while still being challenging. At least, that's how the game is now. One of the most notoriously hard FNAF challenges ever is the pre-patch max mode for Sister Location's Custom Night. It was so hard that Scott had to patch it to make the resource management more fair. But in its current state, it seems to be much more forgiving and actually achievable for an average person who wants to try it. For this video, every challenge I played was on hard mode, which I feel is the best difficulty for those who are pretty decent at FNAF, but maybe aren't completely cracked at it. I was able to go through everything and it felt completely fair while also not being too easy. I haven't tried much of the very hard mode yet, but now that I have some more practice, maybe I'll mess around with it later. Anyway, enough rambling, how does the gameplay itself fare? The office here is identical from the one used in Entered Night, which like I mentioned earlier, is a great way to make the player already familiar with the environment at hand, making the addition of new mechanics and characters less of a major jump in difficulty or intensity. However, this also means that the weird mouse movement from Sister Location's base game is also here in all its finicky glory. It's a far cry from the use of the computer's standard mouse like in prior FNAF games, but it's not as terrible here as it is in some other parts of the base game, such as the baby keypad section. Just like Entered Night, we have two doors on each side of the room, along with a vent at the top that can also be closed. Power mechanics carry over from Entered Night as well, but they seem to be a little less strict as they were there, although I'm not 100% positive on that. Regardless, it's still best to use your power as infrequently as possible, and to instead rely on audio cues to make your movements. Alongside the power mechanic comes a brand new oxygen meter. This one is pretty simple. Certain characters on the roster can lower it, and if it reaches zero, it results in a game over. The same for power, obviously. The oxygen mechanic is so minor, and is never really a huge issue to deal with, so I found its inclusion a pretty reasonable distraction to keep track of, while having most of your attention on some of the more urgent aspects of the gameplay. And that's it for the basics. More complicated than something like FNAF 1's layout, but it's still fairly manageable, and never feels like too much at once for most of the challenges. Visually, I think most of the camera renders here look great. Just like Entered Night, the characters are either rendered with or filtered with some cool effect that smooths everything over. And while it's kind of hard to notice that fact in-game, it still ends up looking great, and giving us some of the best renders any of these characters have officially. Although I will say, some of the office renders and animations look a little weird? Huh? I absolutely think all the new jump scares are a major downgrade from the ones in base game, since the lack of moving faceplates here on the main cast makes everyone look way too static. They kinda just pop in and do nothing. Yendo especially looks god awful. I always thought it was one of the worst jump scares in this game. Getting into what each of the characters on the roster do, First up, we have Ballora. Ballora can come from either one of the doors, so you constantly have to be paying attention to which direction she's coming from. Unlike most of the other characters, her position on the camera is unknown, and the only way to figure out which way she's coming from is to listen in on your headphones to find out which side she's on. 
If her music gets too loud on one side, you'll know she's at that door and you'll have to close it on her. Wait until the music fades away or she crosses to the other side of the room to release the door back up and continue playing. I thought this was easily going to be my least favorite mechanic here, but man, I absolutely love how Ballora works. It's never that hard to tell when her music is at the loudest point, even if it may take a bit to figure it out fully. And the way her audio works here in the gameplay is insanely cool. I don't even know how to describe this, but the way the audio works here is that when she crosses to the other side of the room, you can almost feel it through your headphones. It's like there's a tiny Ballora spinning through your head back and forth. It's a really impressive effect. I should also mention here that as far as I can tell, Ballora is the de facto power out jump scare character of this custom night, like Freddy in FNAF 1. Kind of a cool idea, but too bad her jump scare is complete ass. Next up is Funtime Freddy. He moves back and forth between two closets and attempts to send Bon Bon to come and jump scare you. This is another very audio heavy character since you need to pay attention to both what voice lines he says and which of the two rooms he's currently in. If Funtime Freddy tells Bon Bon to go and get you, you have to close the door that is on the same side he's on. But if you hear, get ready for a surprise, that means you have to close the opposite door. It's a great mechanic that really forces you to always pay attention to where Funtime Freddy is on the map. One of my favorite details about this character is that when he moves to the other closet, a small sound is played. If you just check his position once, you in theory never have to check it again, since you can just keep track of his position based on the sound that plays. It's a fantastic detail that really encourages playing without checking the cameras as often and actually using the audio hints the game gives you. You can probably already see, just with these two characters, how much brain power this requires. You have to pay attention to both the volume and position of Ballora, and also pay attention to the side and voice lines of Funtime Freddy, which is a lot to keep track of for sure. However, as you could probably guess, that's not where the sound-based mechanics end. Enter Biddy Bab. That is a phrase I thought I would never say in my entire life. They reside in the top vent and will only ever come to you in that section. They have multiple phases and you need to pay attention to when they reach their final phase to shut the vent door on them. When you hear them bang on the door, you know it's safe to open it up and wait for them to appear again. That goes for most of the characters you use the door on as well. There will be a very apparent thud sound when you successfully block them which is incredibly satisfying and plays into the great audio design of this game. However, even though you can use the cameras to check what phase Biddy Bab is on, it's actually significantly more beneficial to use the audio cues they give you and to time your movements that way. When Biddy Bab first enters a vent, they'll say a voice line. And when they're at their final stage, a sound kind of like a small thud can be heard. Now this last sound can sometimes be pretty easy to miss, especially when a million other things are going on. But if you're unsure, you can always just check the cameras. The last of the main threats is Funtime Foxy. I won't spend that much time on them since their mechanic is fairly straightforward. Essentially, they just work the same way Foxy does in FNAF 1. They have four different stages before they leave their cove and come to your office. The more you check on them, the less likely it is they will move, and when you successfully block them out of your office, they will drain 3% from your total battery power. This is really the only character that you 100% need to check the camera for at all times, since they have no audio cues to tell you when they run. And even if they did, you would still be punished constantly for ignoring them by losing power every time they come. So I'm fine with how they work here. Having at least one of the main threats use the cameras entirely helps them stand out from the rest of the cast. The remainder of the characters are all kind of just distractions you have to deal with. Lolbit will show up on the monitors in the office, and you need to type LOL on the keyboard or the in-game keypad to make them go away. If you're too slow, they'll appear on screen for a bit and prevent you from using the doors. Bonnet will occasionally appear in the office, and you have to click on their nose to make them leave. Failure to do so will result in a jump scare, which is literally just a recolor of the Bon Bon one. Yendo works like Golden Freddy in FNAF 2. He will appear in the office, and you need to flip up the monitor to get rid of them. The longer he's on screen, the more oxygen in the room will get drained. Failure to act on him fast enough will result in a jump scare. Mini Arena 2 is probably my least favorite character mechanic in the game. They will block your vision in the office with a maximum of five Mini Arena capable of being on screen at once. There's no way of stopping them getting in the room and they never leave the screen. They just stay there the entire time. This feels like such a lazy mechanic with such an artificial difficulty to it and it feels extremely odd and out of place. Not really a fan of this one, but I can see what Scott was going for here. The final characters on the roster are the other mini arenas and the Electrobabs. Both of these characters pretty consistently spawn in at once, so you can usually deal with both of these at the same time. If a warning symbol appears next to either the power or oxygen UI, you know that there's an issue and you have to stop them on the cameras. The mini arenas are pretty straightforward. They will always appear on the same camera and drain the oxygen meter. 
simply click the control chalk button to make them wither away into nothingness, which is a very funny animation. The Electro Babs are a little more complicated, but not by much. They can appear in one of two places, and will slowly drain your power. These places just so happen to be the closets that Funtime Freddy resides in, so the Electro Bab will always be in the closet that Funtime Freddy isn't in. As long as you know where Freddy is, you know where the Electro Bab is by default. Simply give him a controlled shock to make them leave. And that's every character mechanic. While all the distraction ones are pretty simple, they do stack together fairly well, and similar to Foxy and Freddy in FNAF 1, help complement the more aggressive characters pretty well. When it all comes together, Sister Location Customite has to be one of the strongest gameplay loops that, while maybe lacks the complexity of some of the previous entries on a character-by-character -character basis, comes together to make something just plain fun. There's even more stuff here it could go on about, such as the fantastic music by Leon Riskin, the iconic Afton walking cutscenes, and of course, the Dark Springtrap reveal. But I gotta stop somewhere, and I think I've made my point. So, was I wrong about Sister Location? Does Custom Knight salvage enough of what the base game left behind and make it an experience worth playing? Well, I think if you're a FNAF fan, you should absolutely play Sister Location completely at least once. Although I would never blame someone for giving up at Night 4 or especially Entered Night. However, Custom Knight is absolutely worth playing and is easily on par or even better than some of the previous entries when it comes down to pure gameplay. I wouldn't say I was wrong about Sister Location as a whole. Pretty much everything I said in my original video still applies, but Customite should really be treated as a separate thing, because man, it's a blast. And that, my friends, is the end of the Sister Location Saga, and the beginning of Season 2. I want to give some shoutouts to everyone who helped make this possible. First off, if you've noticed the editing is better at all, that's thanks to the new channel editor, Acid. She's a close friend of mine who's been on the channel multiple times, and it's great to have them on board helping me out. Make sure to follow them on Twitter, which will be linked in the description. These fancy new character stills and slight character redesign is done by Frankie, aka Silly Strings on Twitter. I found them through a piece of fan art a couple months back, and it's been great working with them. Follow them on Twitter as well. Finally, I commissioned Garrett Williamson, who you may remember is the creator of the FNAF Not Scary series, and more importantly, an extremely talented musician, to do the new main theme for this season of content. It's based on the song I was already using for the outro screens last year, which was also composed by Garrett. I love how the song turned out, and I highly recommend working with him if you ever need music for something. Anyway, that's all for now. This should be a good year of content, with a bit more variety than last year, hopefully. But I'm sure it's all going to be stuff you guys will enjoy regardless. Anyway, I've been Ah uh, Yeah, and I'll see you all next time.